of today. So it is um, a great pleasure to have a uh, well-known person here as our speaker today. I almost think I don't need to introduce him. Ili Bastian is, uh, of course, here at the Astronomische Reffen Institute, and uh, I think most of us, uh, most of you know him. So let me just give a little bit about the Lebenslauf. Uh, he, he studied um, in Kaiserslautern, Heidelberg, in uh, uh, 1969 to uh, in the mid 70s in physics, and then in 1981 he came to the. Uh, he, he finished his uh, PhD thesis at the observatory, and then uh, a year later went to the Astronomische Rechen Institute. And he uh, is, of course, very well known for his work on, uh, on Hipparchos and now, of course, the successor mission, Gaia. And so we're all very interested to know what, um, what the first results of uh, this uh, very important mission is. So um, Gaia uh, has started uh, in 2013 and uh, the first data release was already a couple of months ago, so the uh, new data release will come soon. I'm sure very, very curious to what will come out. Um, Uli is also well known for his uh, work in uh, public outreach, so he has done uh, 25 years of work on uh, uh, with the Stern und Weltraum Zeitschrift magazine and uh, uh, answered many letters from, uh, from people who wanted to know things about astronomy. So uh, that means he knows how to bring complicated things to a uh, general audience. And I think that is a very important quality as well. And for that he actually got the, Hans, uh, the Bruno Hans uh, Bürger Prize. Um, so that's not really that stuff. So, we are all very interested to hear what he's going to talk about, so I'll just give the, the, the two to you. Okay, thank you. Working for so long on one project and on one goal makes you sometimes uh, feel like Sisyphus, the ancient king of uh, Corinth, who uh, is known to have been so nasty to the gods that in the end they condemned him to eternally roll up a heavy uh, rock up a mountain slope and the curse is that each time he just he almost reaches the summit of the mountain the rock slips from his hands and rolls down the, the mountain slope back to the valley and several times I have felt like this but there is one decisive difference between this ancient hero and uh, the Gaia team. We are actually, we are actually. Ah, that's a bit. Sorry. But there is one decisive difference between this ancient hero who eternally does that. Um, the Gaia team is about to finally and definitely deliver uh, the rock at the mountain top. And meanwhile we are at a point where nothing uh, can prevent us from doing so next, next year. Uh, well, except a uh, giant meteorite impact or a third or something. <laughs> um, before going uh, really to the story of Gaia, let me say a word about the history of this talk. Like, uh, last September, Ralph Klissen uh, wrote an email to me. We yes, had a super when we were über the Geschichte and the Entwicklung des Projekts bis zum aktuellen Stand at St. Prindus. And then auf den aktuellen Data Release eingehen könntest. Okay? Uh, I agree to do that and that's what I will do. So this talk is not about the science of Gaia, not about uh, the, the data. It is about the project as such and how it runs. Okay, the title of the talk says 
1992 till today, 25 years of uh, and so on. Well, in fact, I would like to go even further back. I mean, the, guy, the story of Gaia really starts exactly 50 years ago, almost to the day, 50 years ago, in 1967, uh, a French astronomer made the first proposal for a space astronomy mission to the then just founded French space agency CNES. And the story of Gaia, as any good story, has its heroes, and one of them is Pierre Lacroute, the French man from Strasbourg that I just mentioned. He proposed a, a moderate little uh, telescope to go in a low Earth orbit to do something similar to meridian service on the ground, but undisturbed by all the disturbing environment uh, circumstances on the Earth, like the atmosphere, gravity, thermal changes, etc. To go just a bit beyond uh, what, what could be reached on the ground for more stars and to better. And the second hero, already active at the time, was is, uh, Eric Hülk, a Danish guy from uh, Copenhagen who most of his, uh, a significant part of his career worked at Hamburg, and he is the 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 engineer, the, the inventor of many of the things going into the partners, the predecessor of Gaia, and also into Gaia itself. Um, so, in automobilism, he would be uh, Karl Benz, while uh, Joko Valesky, a Frenchman from Nice and Gas, southern France, he would be the, the diner. He turned the ideas of Lacroix and, uh, and uh, Hülk into a real project. He collected consortium. He was the one to turn Gaia from the smallest French agency and from the smallest instrument to the big uh, ESA uh, agency and to a big project. And he, he, he is the organizer. Then there is Leonard Lindgren. Uh, Swedish person, the mastermind behind all the mathematics and, and concepts of the Hipparchus, as well as Gaia data reduction. Eric Hilt also was, uh, he's now high in his 80s, but he was active and important for Gaia all the time. And then there is, well, automobilism, I would say that could be Henry Ford. We have Michael Perry here uh, at the left in 1988. Talk shortly before the launch of Hipparchus, talking to Pierre Lacroix. He was the one who, who, who brought the power in, who organized the, the, it at large scale, who pushed in particular ESA along with the, the, the big and lazy administration. Okay, I could go on with dozens of other people who were important, but I want to mention one very specific, uh, one very special hero, and that is uh, Flo van Leeuwen. He is a Dutch guy who worked almost all his career in Cambridge, UK, and our, the Hipparchus project ended in 1997 with the release of the Hipparchus catalog. And in the 10 years after, he alone, as one man, repeated, started the Hipparchus data reduction from scratch in a one man show before it was a three-digit uh, head consortium and achieved an, an important improvement here. An incredible achievement for a single guy being a uh, plant data center manager at, uh, at the same time. And well, at least his hair got crazy in this in his two, ten years. I also would like to point out that at least 3,000 people in total have contributed to this Sisyphus work, starting from proud and very important series of ESA directors of science, through normal, hard-working uh, scientists and software developers. This is the Gaia group in 2011, about two years from uh, the, the Ali Gaia group, uh, about two years before launch, and all the way 
to humble and almost invisible institute administrators, institute secretaries, and IT ex experts. Good. Uh, I started in 1967, 50 years ago. I could also have started in 1576, the start of modern astronomy by Tycho Brahe in, in Denmark. I could also have started in 150 before Christ, the start of known astronomy. The, old, the oldest known uh, star positions were measured by Hipparchus of Nicaea in uh, 150 before Christ, with a precision of slightly better than a degree. But I decided for 1967. Hipparchus, Hipparchus, the predecessor of Gaia, the first space astronomy revision, uh, flew from 1989 to 1993, and the name of that is on the one hand an, uh, an honor to this ancient Greek, but at the same time, the name of Hipparchus is a, is a very clever acronym. It's high precision parallax collecting satellite. Uh, that's very nice, and it was invented by Chokovalevsky, one of the heroes. And the name of Gaia, what I'm mainly talking about today, uh, it once was an acronym. It once was Global Astrometric Interferometer for Astrophysics. But it is no longer, because Gaia no longer is an interferometer optically, and thus we spell Gaia with lowercase letters, but with uppercase letters. Just to educate. <laughs> okay. Um, now a question to the audience. Do you all at least roughly know what Gaia is about? Please raise your hands, as I will skip the next one of the slides. Okay, good. Gaia is uh, the ESA space mission intended to measure, to do astronomy, that is positional astronomy, on at least one billion stars, and for each of these stars to measure the position, parallax, proper motion, and as a result, the brightness and cloud colors of, the, of these sources, with absolutely unprecedented and unreachable accuracy from the ground, astronomy is targeted at 20 to 25 micro arc seconds, or 0.025 milli arc seconds, down to 15th magnitude, and the limiting magnitude to be at 20 uh, in, in the optimum. And there, about, even there, half, better than half a milli arc second precision. So for comparison, the Parkes measures about 100,000 stars to around 1 milli arc second. So we go for 10,000 times as many stars for typically 50 times the precision. A giant leap made possible by a number of inventions and by technology. Good. Now let's go into this short history of Gaia. It started in 1992, as the title of this talk says, with discussions among some leading members of the Hipparchus community why Hipparchus was still working but when the success was already obvious, what do we do as the next stage? And the year after, Eric Rupp made the first moderate proposal to ESA. Something going a modest step further called Röber, working quite differently than in Parvus. And the year after, Oh no, the same year, 1993, ESA set up a committee, the famous Voltaire Committee, to design and recommend a long-term plan for ESA space science called Horizon 2000. And two of the many goals that this committee set was uh, were to do astrometry at the 10 micro arc seconds level as a strategic goal of ESA. And secondly, among others, to fly with the foreign <coughs> aspects in, in space. And sly as these uh, astronomers sometimes are, the original Gaia concept made a, a nice combination of the two. The optics was indeed an interferometer, as, uh, about three 
eta size, eta ferrometer, with two relatively small amplitudes of a, of a sixth of the diameter, a three gear elastic mark with a moderate wave length, uh, focal length, and a focal plane here with <coughs> a CCT. Like the part was, the detector here would not have been able to resolve the image and thus to measure the location of the image by resolving it and locating it. But instead, like the part was, the, the spatial modulation of the image on the photo plane was transformed into a time signal, into a, a sinusoidal time, time signal by the slow rotation of the satellite. So, unresolved spatial uh, optics using a time signal, we could, from the phase of the, of the time signal, gain information on the position of the star on the focal plane and from the amplitude on its, on its, uh, uh, its magnetic brightness. This interferometer created a fringe pattern with many fringes and the, the, the fringes moving across the focal plane created uh, a sinusoidal modulation. Now, this is kind of the optimum astrometric information that you can get from a given number of collected photons because the astrometry is not in, in the bulk of the, of the light but it is in the steep slopes of the images. There's the astrometry. So, uh, you have many, many slopes but it turned out later on that this is not the optimum condition. In 1995, uh, we had a, a, a science conference in uh, Cambridge to collect the bigger audience, to discuss the concepts. The first papers appeared and this concept was proposed. This was presently enough for ESA to go ahead to take it seriously and to start uh, an industrial feasibility study, what we call phase A study. That's a usual stage in such a mission. Then it turned out that this concept is, is not as good as it originally uh, seemed. The many fringes, to be sharp, necessitated uh, a quite narrow uh, wavelength range, as they would be blurred. Um, this concept to, to measure these fringes was extremely complicated electronically and from the detectors. And so, the development from during this feasibility study from 1997 to 1999 went from many fringes to just a few fringes, which is optimized in a different way with an aperture filled to two thirds and then to the full aperture. This is kind of optimum. Uh, astrometric information per surface area and given outer dimension of the optics and this in the end turned out to be the optimum astrometric information per telemetry bit because you need less uh, bits here to, to cover this than, than this. So in the end we were back with the full aperture, the interferometer was gone and the next area became uh, a paradoxon, because Gaia is the Greek word for the Earth, or goddess of the Earth, and uh, Gaia has nothing to do with the Earth. Gaia doesn't want to do anything, have anything to do with the Earth. It has to be 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth in order to measure. Not even a geostationary Earth orbit is quiet enough to allow the fine measurements that Gaia has to do. Okay, this feasibility study, I want to go into a little in a, in a few details. This is the optics development. One of the important problems of this phase was the feasibility of the, aspect of the data reduction, of the self-calibration of the instrument geometry, the detector, the rotational motion of the, of the satellite, and the star design, of course. Uh, the Hipparchus method that was so successful could no longer work because of the sheer size of the problem on one hand and because it involved some approximations that at the higher precision just didn't work or couldn't work. So a more direct 
a method was proposed by by Huntingley, one of the heroes I mentioned, but it was completely unproven. So these are said no way to go ahead uh, as long as we don't know that it will work also on the data reduction side. So within two years, a mock-up of the method was programmed in SPIT in Holland uh, and ran through the Hippasus um, data. And it worked. Um, the outcome was that the diet data reduction would be 10 to the 19 to 10 to the 21 floating operations on the, com on the computer. Which in other words means 100 to 10,000 gigafloat years. Which in the late uh, 80s, uh, the late 90s, was almost unimaginable. It was clear we cannot buy the computers needed to do this for a science project. <coughs> uh, but you have to rely on Moore's law to go on for 10 more years to be able to afford the data reduction. But that was true for Hippocrates at the time as well. Good. Uh, so that worked. And a lot of other things work, and ESA had spent 3 million euros on this feasibility study, and the outcome in that the year 2000 was this recently in the book, the Concept and Technology Study Report, also called the White Book of Phase A Study. And it said, we have three telescopes on board, we launched with Mary on five, with four and a half tons of weight, go to the Earth moon and do one Earth, some L2, 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. Uh, we run for five years, we have two astrometric telescopes and one for uh, spectroscopy separately. The two astrometric ones are needed because such a mission needs two viewing directions far apart on the sky to be self calibrating. We had 15 meters of focal plane, 1.7 meters aperture width. We would have 11 micro arc seconds of precision at uh, 15th magnitude and 160 micro arc seconds at the 20th magnitude, which would also be the limiting magnitude. And plus filter photometry, 15 bands, and regular uh, velocity spectrometer. So all our dreams were to come true. The mountain top of Sisyphus was really in view. Then, the next two years, uh, ESA formed two, uh, signed, uh, two uh, industry consortia and assigned them a detailed design study, so called phase B study. ESA committed 35 million euros and approved Gaia as a, as a cornerstone mission in its long term program. Uh, Horizons 2000. Okay, then the rock rolled down the mountain slope for the first time because in 2002 ESA ran into a financial crisis. A strong cost reduction of 130 or so million euros was requested for, from Gaia. Um, industrial reassessment took place. In 2002, Gaia was re-approved, but after strong restrictions. From what I have shown you just now, after this reassignment, we had no longer three telescopes, but only 1.5. Uh, the two astrometric ones were partly combined into one. The spectroscopic one was completely uh, skipped and put in the corner of the focal plane of 1.5. Instead of three focal planes, we had only one. The focal length had been reduced to 35 meters, giving, less, giving smaller CCD pixels. And the size performance had also shrunk a bit. The filter photometry in 515 bands that had eaten up Several man years to optimize was gone. Instead, we had short spectra, which are very lucky for photometry for many reasons. So, oh, come on. we had to uh, do the best out of that. Good. Nevertheless, 
Gaia was reimproved. The next, at the same time, a lot of other uh, similar projects at smaller scope appeared. Eva in Germany, Fame in the US, Yasmin in uh, Japan, three different Russian ones, etc. These had appeared up to the year 2000, and in the years 2002 to 3, they all faltered and disappeared for technical reasons, for, uh, because they didn't get the funding. And in 2005, after the completion of the Phase B study, which resulted in this summary and about 5,000 pages of technical documentation, these are finally approved called industry to form consortia and to make a, a cost and a detailed proposal and call the scientists also to form a consortium. Both science and industry now have to give proposals to ESA which have to be accepted. That is the tedious part of things. Then in 2006, one of the two industry proposals was selected, the Astrium one not the uh, Italian French one. Uh, and this amount, uh, amounts to the start of the construction contract. These are committed 700 million euros. And the detailed design will start. At the same time, we wrote a big proposal to ESA, 4 centimeters of paper which was approved, and this is the science results. Okay, now, at this point, the full thing is ready, started coming. Full ramp-up of the national funding for the data reduction, full ramp-up of industry uh, activities, which then went up to 1,200 people at the same time in 2010 or 11. Okay, I make a break here and tell you a few of the changes. In, in, in such a development process. In 2003, the uh, then still very small science consortium at one of the meetings started to build up its, its organization. And uh, the consortium as a whole decided to be divided in nine consortia and into nine sub consortia, so called coordination units. And one of them was uh, responsible for the basic data processing and for the astrometric ground basic solution. And, uh, and at that meeting, the question arose, and who will be the manager of this unit? And I was about to say, ah, of course, Leonard Lindemann. And that, but he was one second quicker and said, ah, of course, we must do. So everybody looked at me and then I did manager job. In the end, it turned out it would be a good decision because it freed Leonard, the mastermind, to do dozens and dozens of more fabulous inventions on the math and conceptual side of the guy. Okay, let's identify silicon carbide. Do you know what silicon carbide is? It is diamond with exactly half of the core carbon atoms replaced by silicon. This is silicon carbide. In everyday life, it's known as uh, carbonyl or in German, carbon. Uh, usually used as um, for, for sawing, cutting and grinding steel or glass or quartz or other hard uh, materials. It's the scientist's dream and the engineer's nightmare. Uh, it is almost as hard as diamond. And it is produced in, in the form, it, it has a high uh, thermal conductivity, very good for a stable astrometric instrument. It is extremely hard, it is, it, that is bad. It is extremely, it is extremely uh, stri strong and stiff mechanically, that is wonderful. It has a very low thermal expansion, just a factor of 10 more than separate uh, yeah, it is produced by chemically precipitation, ground to a fine powder, pressed for shaping. The fine powder is pressed and compacted, and 
then we see that the 2.2 uh, thousand candidates, and in the process it shrinks by 18 to 20 percent. That is, if you want to have a, a one meter piece of, uh, of, of fabric of this, for instance, the, the uh, ground plate plate of the uh, the ground plate of the Gaia photo plane. If you want to have a one meter piece, you have to prepare one meter twenty piece. Then it shrinks by eighty to twenty percent, which is linear in the volume. This is forty five to fifty percent. And worst of all, this is controllable only to a few tenths of a percent. So we have to prepare it at one meter twenty. It shrinks to a meter plus minus half a centimeter. And on this thing, then you want to uh, position see, 100 CCDs with a precision of 10 micrometers in five dimensions. Right. And after sintering, it is extremely hard. So machining is very ugly and very difficult. Yeah, that's one of the nice things here. That impressed me at the time. Geographic return. I don't want to be the manager, neither on the eastern nor the industry side, of such a project. Because this manager cannot simply take the best offers out of the 50 plus industrial subcontractors that do their proposals to the project, but it has to obey what's called geographic return. 24% of the whole money has to go to Germany, 18% to France, and so on and so on. Right. It must be really difficult. Then, two of the things we discovered on the science side in these development years. Sometime in 2003, I realized, oh dear, with this data reduction method, we will not know for 1.5 years after launch that this thing really works to the precision. Because we need 1.5 years of data to achieve this full self calibration. Come on. Uh, that is, of course, too risky. With Hipparchus, this problem didn't exist because Hipparchus was so imprecise uh -huh, uh, that uh, some approximations could be made and a, a calibration every day could be done to show the full precision of the measurements. So we had to invent something completely new that did not make these uh, approximations but still could go in further than Hipparchus. We managed not only the problem was discovered at Ali, but it was also solved at Ali by Hans Bernstein, who died a few years ago already. Uh, he designed the method, and others like Michel Biermann, Stefan Nordon implemented the method. So, a few days after we had full precision data collected, we already knew, in fact, during the mission, that it worked. I could say, confidently go along with the mission. The other thing is keyboard, ground, Gaia ground-based optical tracking is the name of this. Also, at, at around the same time, ESOC, the European Space Ground uh, Segment in Darmstadt, discovered that in order to be able to do the fine reduction for Gaia to 20 micro we need to know the absolute velocity of Gaia with respect to the barycenter of the solar system to 2.5 millimeters per second at any time in the five years. 2.5 millimeters is a slightly less than 10 to the minus 8 of Gaia's orbital velocity around the sun. And the engineers there, having had decades of uh, experience with high precision orbit determination, realized that their nice tracking methods we're just not able to, to guarantee that. So what to do? I have a nice idea. Let's observe Gaia from the ground with ordinary astrographs and telescopes. Estimates said Gaia would be 17th or 18th magnitude. There, so a half meter to one meter telescope would suffice in a few minutes to have a nice uh, observation. And what we needed was 20 million seconds precision every day. Observations from the ground of Gaia to, to guarantee the orbit. Well, 
that possibly, as well as astrometry, from the ground, 20 million things, in a small thing. Uh, but we had no reference catalog of this position. So, the idea was, we take the observations, and then we wait until Gaia has produced the first catalog of sufficient precision to reduce these observations. To feed back into the Gaia orbit, to get from the linear second to the micro One of the little oddities, and uh, well, each of these discoveries rolled down the rock a few meters, the mountain slope, and we had to roll it up again. Who did you that might uh, uh, skip this? Ah, oh, the purchase of the CCDs. Um, ESA, in this uh, phase B, between 2003 and 2005, realized that the CCDs needed for Gaia, so many, 102 are mounted, so we have to produce about 200 to be on the safe side, without seeing uh, bad, bad specimens, etc. It was not possible to produce these till 2009, 10 or so, when they have to be mounted. When we start, when we wait with ordering them, up to the full approval of Gaia, and to the full start of the scientific, of the industrial phase. So, in 2004, it was, or five, yeah, 2004 or five it was, that ESA ordered these many 4.5 by 6 centimeter CCDs, together they cover a square meter of the focal plane, you see here roughly half of them, they ordered the CCDs without knowing that Gaia could be built, because that is here only at the end of phase B, without having finally approved the project, and it was a contract of 35 million euros going to the company to be in, in, in Great Britain. But they were confident enough, and we had convinced them so much of the scientific value that they said, okay, we spend this, we take this risk, else we have to send them to NASA and put the military to work who may happen. Okay. The basic angle. Ah, Gaia no longer is a, is an interferometer astrometrically. The telescopes are no longer an interferometer. But the view angle between the two telescopes has to be very, very stable. In the case of Gaia, to form micro accidents on the long run and to a few dozen micro accidents on the long run. Oh, the short run and the long run. And the industry studies show passive stability will just not be enough to guarantee this. So, an eternal interferometer was built and incorporated into Gaia, measuring internally the angle to a precision of 0.5 microarchs. So to guarantee these four microarchitects, really, as yeah, originally it was a safety check, because it couldn't have heard. And these open five microarchitects at the edges <coughs> uh, uh, corresponds to a movement of four picometers of the edges of this 1.5 meter mirror. So this interferometer was designed, was built, is flying, and is the most precise instrument ever flown in space. Or design. Meanwhile, we have another one on the river pathfinder, but that came later. That was at, at the time the most precise instrument ever to be flown in space. It runs. Uh, let me skip these as the administrative things. Ah, but this is a nice thing. Have you ever seen? An uh, airplane business class seat reserved and uh, a boarding pass issued for a piece of electronics. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting on seat 3A in, a, in an airplane going from Peru to France and back. Four weeks before the plane launch, and end of October 9, uh, 2013 on a completely unrelated space mission, uh, a transponder failed. That is a piece of electronics generating the uh, radio waves going back to Earth. And the mission was lost. 
and two of these transporters are dying. So, ah, what to do? An unacceptable risk. It turned out, after a short analysis of a few days, that it was a design bug in these transporters, not just a random accidental uh, materials uh, problem, but a design bug. One innocent transistor somewhere was overloaded. So, what to do? Four weeks before launch. After a hectic weekend at Kourou, Gaia had been there already for a few months and integrated and on, on top of the tower to be ready to be put on the, on the Ariane, on the uh, Soyuz. Well, it had to be quick in order we would have lost a, a long run today. It had to be safe. No, no way to, to send this back to Europe just as a parcel. It had to be a company. Okay, so it went as a passenger. And not only that, no X-ray, no microwaving, uh, no uh, ultrasound, no opening for inspection. <laughs> the director of the Guyana Space Center, plus the boss of the uh, security and, and ground uh, support at the Kourou Airplane, plus the uh, Gaia project manager and the head of police of Guyana went to the airport to get this around the safety measure. Okay, it worked, it was repaired, it came back, and there was a block entry, Gaia is home again. Four weeks before the launch was back, but it had caused a four weeks delay. Good. Then, December 19, 2030, the big day. Here you see Gaia at an altitude of a few meters of, of ground, 315 <coughs> tons, lifting off from Guyana. Two minutes later, only 250 tons left at a height of a few dozen kilometers. And that very evening, uh, a, French, uh, a Dutch amateur astronomer called Gaia at a distance of 100,000 kilometers from Earth, crossing the sky between the stars, floating towards its location where it should work at about, at that time, about 2 kilometers a second. And that is a, is a, is a nice feeling on, on, on such a day, especially during the launch sequence, which takes about 2 hours. Uh, there's a saying at the court in the open seas, you are in the hands of God. Yes, I can say, I can add that uh, as well during the launch sequence. It all worked nicely. Gaia went up, the so we rocket worked. The big 11 meter sun sheet unfolded. And Gaia, in the next 18 days, gradually drifted to its uh, station at Edu and arrived there on January 7 and was then regularly photographed by uh, telescopes from the ground, this ground-based optical tracking. After it turned, had turned to its uh, operation orientation 45 degrees to the sun, it turned out that it's not 17th or 18th magnitude, but only 21. <laughs> this, uh, Backside is uh, smoother and darker than expected. So from 50 to 100 centimeter telescopes, we had to go to 2 meter telescopes. The ESO VST is uh, doing the service for marginal only the reductions. Okay. But it was there anyway, and I can tell you, it took me four or six weeks to, to get used to the thought that it is really there after 20 years of time. Okay. Bef even before it had reached the uh, two orbit, it, uh, we switched on, we, we did a lot of tests and industry did a lot of tests and adjustments. And on January 2, the first science instrument was switched on, which is the interferometer. And immediately, very nice fringes to be seen. Wonderful. The, op means the optics are quite well uh, aligned. The telescope has uh, so nicely survived, undamaged and un, uh, un, unaligned. Uh, the, the launch, 180 pp of, of now sound, 
15 uh, uh, Earth acceleration of shocks, etc. All find that the CCD is working, the ferrometer is working, all find, oh well, this, uh, the pattern is a bit offset from where it should be, but that can easily be repaired by a few electronic commands shifting the window right out from the CCDs, and now it looks really nice. But what's that? These pretty fringes that measure the fluid angle between the two telescopes, they should be extremely stable there. To four micro artifacts, that was the spec. But in fact, what they did is to move on the CCD in a periodic fashion by a thousand micro artifacts, which means a violation of the specification by a factor of 250. The rock going down part of the uh, mark so at least. This one million second amplitude of 5 times 10 to the minus 9 radians is just 4 nanometers of movement. A dozen silicon atoms uh, movement of the, of the mirrors relative to each other of the two telescopes. Or an even smaller end if it's not the big one but another of the, of the smaller mirrors. But it works very, very nicely. The noise on this nice curve is really below one like art second, or in other words, just a dozen picometers. Okay, let's then switch on the astrometric CCDs. What we will see? Nice star images, wonderful. The telescope really is almost focused. It's like we're focusing in roof time even. But what's that? These nice star images are superposed on an on a extremely high background. Background that quickly turned out to be light. Uh, this is uh, the measured background flux on the, on the uh, CCDs in, in a logarithmic scale as function of time, where from here <coughs> to here is one of six hour revolution of Gaia. It is up to a hundred times higher than it should be. The telescope, and any astronomical telescope should be dark inside, but it is very bright inside. Oh dear. A lengthy, year-long analysis showed, uh, showed that it is due to, different, to several design and fabrication uh, bugs at the same time. Uh, we had insufficient baffling, we had uh, uh, fabrication back at the, at the edge of the sun shield where fibers stick out and scatter light into the telescope and also this uh, shield is a bit too small, a few centimeters, in the, out of 11 meters. Okay, that hit the spectroscopic aspect of Gaia very much. They lost one magnitude of limiting brightness uh, or a factor of two to three of their, of their objects. It hit severely but not disastrously the photometry and it is almost not damaged or very slightly damaged the astronomy, fortunately. Because the astrometry has pretty bright images. Okay. Uh, but it was a big shock. Back to the Images, these uh, images, uh, all the 102 CCDs are working fine. After a slight refocusing, they also uh, were really nice. But what's that again? After just a few days, we realized or noticed that these images got fainter and fainter. And after only three weeks after switch on, they had lost 70% of their brightness. At this point, <laughs> this was turned over and along with this rock ran down the whole slope of the mountain. At this point, we almost always very constructive and, and very positive. Deputy project scientist of ESA wrote in an email 
this region is blue. What may happen? This is response loss in magnitudes versus time in, in, in quarter days. Within three, three weeks, one of the two fleets of you had lost 70% of the life and the other one more than 20% of the life. <coughs> and the suspicion was that this is water ice depositing on the optics, on, on, the, on the mirrors of the telescopes. This could be proven by heating up the telescope, there's heaters on board, and we heated up one one mirror that was the prime suspect in one of the two telescopes where the damage was biggest, where it was 70%. And nicely it returned to only, to only 15%. Within 20 minutes at minus 60 degrees centigrade. Ah, that was the proof it's water ice. Okay. Uh, but the whole thing continued, so we decided to heat the full thing. We did so after a few weeks, 500 revolutions is 100 days, no, it's 150 days, so that is in, in April 2014. And look here, this was the transmission at the beginning, we are back. And wow, three weeks, nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> then it started again, and uh, at the end of the year, or towards the end of the year, we had again lost 30% in one field of fuel and 20% in the other. Another partial heating, as an experiment, gave a partial remedy, and after a few weeks it started again. Then another heating, full heating, back to full performance, and for the this is a, a summary of the of, of middle 2014. Four decontaminations, decontaminations have been done. Each time we the observations have to be interrupted for, for weeks because Gaia has to cool down again and get stable. Uh, and each time it, it was slower, but future evolution is unpredictable. Okay, meanwhile we have done six decontaminations. The intervals have become longer and longer, now it's 15 months since the last one, and it's just started. So we will have another one, and that will hopefully be the last one. Okay, so... Uh, oh, I have to skip this. So after the, these shocks of early 2014, Sisyphos again started carrying up the hill, the real data processing started, under, the, under these uh, more difficult conditions, we had to do the calibration, we had to pull us ourselves up the hill again. And finally, in September 2014, two months ago, the first Gaia release was published. It contains a total number of even a bit more, a bit more than a billion sources, and 1.14 billion sources. For all of these, we have positions measured. That was promised for about two years after launch. A catalog of about a billion positions, with a precision of a few mass milliseconds to about 20 milliseconds at the same end and at the least observed sky portion. But in addition to that, over the old promises, we also already provided two million parallaxes and proper motions with a typical precision of 0.3 milliard seconds for the positions and parallaxes and about 1 milliard seconds per year for the proper motion. That is 20 times more than the purpose has delivered. That is about 3 times more precise than the purpose has delivered. Uh, in addition, a few, a few extras, uh, uh, about 3,000 light curves and uh, light element, uh, light, light curve elements of, of various stars. This is 
the uh, distribution of the, of the stars on the sky. What you can see is the value of the Milky Way, so it's really correctly coordinates. What you can see is the band of the Milky Way with all the well known dark features along it. Here's the uh, whole few bit of the um, but, and, and this is uh, are the imaginary clouds, this is the Fornax, Dwarf Galaxy, the Sculptor, and 33 and 31, 47 to Kali, no, uh, Omega Centauri, 47 to, and a number of other globular uh, clusters, nice to see. But what you also see is these arcs. This is not astronomy, uh, astronomy, this is uh, still incomplete and, and still very inhomogeneous sky coverage after just, what is it, 11 months of, of dire measurements. The zoom into a particularly badly covered region shows the star density map with really dark patches, just not enough measurements there. The, de the detected sources are much more smoothly, by the way, but the, the released ones, those for whom we had enough measurements, uh, to make an astronomical resolution at this distance. Okay, just a little bit of science. This is the beautiful uh, hatch from us diagram of the solar neighborhood that you could draw from uh, about half of the one million sources with parallaxes and uh, magnitudes. You see, you see a very sharp and nice uh, sub-giant plant, a, a, a main sequence, a, a secondary main sequence here of, of binary stars. You see a very prominent giant clump. You see this feature here already, which is a, a little turn of the asymptotic branch. So that is all known as the physics. Um, and here, it's a, it's a plot that was released almost on, um, immediately after the release, uh, showing the few Gaia stars that are also in Hipparchus on the uh, and members of the large Magellanic cloud. And these arrows here are the proper motion vectors. And you're very nice to see the rotation of the Magellanic cloud at 50 km kilo parsecs distance from the Earth, one rotation of the cloud takes over 100 million uh, years, and uh, this is using Gaia data of just one year. <coughs> Good. Uh, in the 60 work, uh, in the 83 work days between 14 of September and January 12th, 60 papers using the Gaia data were published between 4.4 uh, one paper per one point four work days and the rate is still increasing. That is very nice. But all this is just a tiny meter appetizer of what's to come in the next year. It is a 0.2% appetizer at strongly reduced decision of the forthcoming guys when they these two. This is an empty slide because, of course, because of course, I'm not allowed to tell you very precise things. Uh, but let me tell you: at the moment, we have in our hands 2.45 billion valid astrometric solutions for stars. Well, there may be a hundred million rubbish among them. Uh, among these are 1.6 billion having full five astrometric parameters, full uh, parallax, proper motion and positions. Well, maybe a few dozen million bumps among them. Uh, but what you may expect, and this I don't keep you written, uh, is anything between 1.5 billion and 2.5 something billion sources in April 2018 with a typical precision of parallax of 0.1 milli arc second or better down to 16th magnitude and typical precision of parallax 
one milliard seconds or better, even at the 20th magnitude, along with very precise proper motions. And that will be the hammer. That will be the final delivery <laughs> of the log on the month ago. And Sisyphus still has not quite completed this task because that rock went after it's on the mountain. That still, that still needs a lot of polishing and the and second half of the, no, the, the last two thirds of the mission duration and data still to be added. But <coughs> already now we know that Gaia will be just fabulous. So, my very last slide is dedicated to Richard and Birman. One day it will be yours. Richard, this day has come. Yes. <laughs> He's my successor. As the free manager in the consortium, as, as executive member of the consortium, and as, as manager of almost a hundred guys and girls kind of all over Europe, and doing the astrometric based solution from the raw data to the very astronomical camera. That's it. Don't let it run wrong. Those that are bright enough and easily measured, 
flows that are well behaved astronomically, no doubles, no variables, etc. So about a hundred million of them are used to set up the system, to self-calibrate light, to determine the properties of the instrument and telescope and uh, detectors and uh, rotational motion and all this stuff. And this is still, what is it, then, uh, 0.5 million unknowns, uh, only 0.5 trillion observations. And these are the primary stars. In the case of release 1, it was just 2 million. In the case of release 2, it will be 9 or more million, and in the end, it will be 100 million. And all the rest are the so called secondary stars. They take the calibrated instrument, the calibrated rotation, the calibrated detector, the calibrated telescope geometry, as two, and just determine the five parameters per star. On your slide with the gems of Gaia, you skipped one bullet, the Rudy Schmidt and Michael Perriman one. Would you discuss this with, for us as well? That is a kind of sad story. Michael Perriman is one of the heroes that I showed at the beginning. And he, he is the, the, the bulldozer of, of the science part, both in, in uh, Hipparchus, he was the Hipparchus science team, a scientist, Hipparchus project scientist, almost from the beginning, and he also was the Gaia scientist almost from the beginning, and he constantly fought with the ESA bureaucracy, with the ESA hierarchies, with the ESA machinery and apparatus. And uh, after 25 years of having done so, almost 25 years, he was plus Gaia, he got a, an ESA project manager in front of him, Uli Schmidt, after having nice and work together with much memory, uh, with a, a few predecessors, that was stronger than mine. <laughs> and after two years of fighting with him, he gave in and quit ESA, quit uh, astronomy almost altogether and, and retired. That is, that is one of the sad stories. Uh, of, of Gaia. I didn't want to go into it. Also, I had to take my time. Well, you, you did not mention it very explicitly, but Gaia also is in some sense a high resolution imager that can tell sources apart, even if they are only, say, 0.3 arc seconds apart. On what time scale will we also learn about close pairs of, of sources from Gaia? Um, that will be in starting from data release 3, not 2 yet, because that is not easy. It is difficult because uh, the images are elongated, the scanning is, is uh, complex. Um, it, it takes time to sort this out. But indeed, yes, Gaia is a high resolution image and it has the angular resolution of the uh, Space telescope essentially, but while the space telescope in 25 years covers a few ppm of the sky at most, Gaia covers the whole sky. It, it makes an imaging survey of the whole sky and especially around every uh, star that it is detects, the, the 1 billion or 2 billion probably, or maybe 2.5. You, in the end, you get images of, this, of a few arc second size at an angular resolution of 0.1 milliards, not only 0.3, but further, um, and down to the 22nd or 23rd or maybe even 24th magnitude. So that is a, a, a very high precision and high resolution census of essentially the entire sky. And it works, it works. We see them, we see faint companions already, but to calibrate them and to combine these into uh, <coughs> And this Kaiser, just this morning, on Archive has appeared a paper using just the source list of the data release one, not the astrometry really, but just the imaging that you see, to discover a 14,000 solar mass 
Stella cluster. Stella means next to zero. Completely unknown up to now. Just from the sources, not using proper motions, not using colors. Just there's a ton of stars. Fancy part, uh, significance. And then they get up to then collect the view of these many sources in, in two mass and yes, it's, it's a nice uh, uh, red giant cloud with a nice but I see the sequence to be seen wonderful. Well only this is neither a technical nor an astrophysical question, but according to Albert Camus we have to consider according, according to Albert Camus, Albert Camus we have to consider Sisyphus a happy man. I'm a happy man. Is this correct? I'm a happy man. And uh, along the same direction, now if you delivered now that you delivered your rock on the mountaintop, we know that you are now uh, retiring. So what's your next big project? <laughs> My name, oh well, yes, yes, you mentioned yes, I I got the title. Uh, exactly one week ago, one week and one hour ago. Uh, well, to go on this guy to uh, supervise a PhD student of the uh, Arnoldskans, to have one more dancing before the film, to go more for nature conservation, etc., etc., and to go on with Dino Grisbaum, real letters. And you are doing a seminar on data science. Yes, <laughs> and I'm doing the school students uh, uh, one week practical with just my time and the, the fall and all. So you will see me. You will continue to see me. That's quite unfair. Yeah. Very nice. I'm um, very happy about that. And thank you very much for this very nice talk. Um, so, so now let's thank Wee for his wonderful talk. <laughs>